he was not fun to work for. He was he was kind of frightening to work for. Whoever drew this is like shit. That rock animal. This guy's this guy's just terrible. You know. <laughs> And Alex just gives him this really scorching look and he begins to tear all the pages up and all of it. We were sure there was going to be a fist fight. These two guys were raging at each other. Don't be surprised that for many years you're doing seven days a week. It can destroy relationships. It just does. <laughs> Hey gang, Shane Patrick White here with another edition of Beyond the Process, where we explore the art of storytelling. With me today, as always, is Lance Laspina. Today's guest hails from the Pacific Northwest. I've known him for quite a while, and his name is Rick Hoberg. Rick, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of work you've done? To be honest with you, I started in uh, Orange County, California, in the Los Angeles area. I was there for a number of years. And I began uh, in the comics biz, working for uh, Russ Manning as a kind of a, 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 a guy who could ape his style because he needed people to draw like Russ Manning for overseas comic book distribution. And uh, that didn't last long. And from there, I actually hooked up with uh, Roy Thomas, who was looking for guys out on the West Coast. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time which is exactly how my whole career has gone. And uh, after that, I ended up in the animation business for a number of years. And through this whole time, I was working in comics and animation. So when I moved up here, I already had a foothold there. So it was pretty easy to keep going in both businesses, especially with FedEx suddenly appearing on the horizon and able to ship stuff around the United States. There wasn't any necessity to actually be in studio all the time. Well, it, it's you know what's interesting is is as I've done a, a bunch of research this week, I've listened to uh, half a dozen podcasts, uh, hearing you talk, and so I'm hoping <laughs> that we can cover some new ground. Um, what I did find interesting is that we have a lot of overlap in our tastes in uh, comics and film and that sort of thing. So I, I like you, I, I was a big fan of Flash Gordon. Um, I loved Errol Flynn and the Robin Hood and the, the Seahawks and um, animation and, and the media as a whole, you know, the simplicity of the story that sort of stays with us for a, a long time, as opposed to the more complicated stuff that that's more in, in the modern view these days. Why do you think uh, the, those kinds of stories can stand the test of time? I, I think there's always a yearning for mythology in, in, in mankind. And I think American mythology is what we want because we're basically Americans. And so I think that's why the superhero uh, is kind of our thing. And it's something that definitely comes from ancient mythology. I mean, we still hearken back and use characters like Thor and, and Hercules and stuff in, in comic books. But we have our own Thors and, and Hercules in, in characters like Superman. And Superman is, of course, the, the epitome of the American hero, in, in my opinion. He's the best of people, and he has the most powerful of powers. So, you know, we, we can only hope he would stay that way. They've even written a lot of stories in recent time where his powers are used for evil, and he's nearly unstoppable. And the people that do have to stop him are his friends with kryptonite, which is a horrible thing to do to a friend, as far as I can discern. So I think that's why that we love this stuff is because of that. So you were you were lucky enough to to start working um, on Tarzan with Russ Manning uh, back in well, what time would that uh, time period would that be? Seventy five, nineteen seventy five is when I got okay. my first gig, uh, and it was just the same. It was only a month or two after I'd gotten married. So. It was, oh, wow. It's an easy time frame for me that way. To be honest with you, as we move forward in time, I've lost track of exactly what happened when and how it overlaps with what, such as when I did Star Wars, the comic book, and when I started working at Hanna-Barbera. Those are things that I'd have to look at my checks to figure out when I was <laughs> doing what and when, because I was doing both at some, certain certain times, wow. you know, doing yeah. storyboard work and drawing comic books which is just the, one of the stupidest things you can do in life. That's if you want to stay living and sane, it is a tremendous amount of work. 
Yeah. So, yeah, it was really fun doing that, though, because Tarzan was literally the first hero that I ever uh, can, rem- can remember as a child. I, I read the Jesse Marsh comic books and, uh, and saw the movies. My dad showed me some of the first films I recall, which were Johnny Weissmuller, Tarzan's, and, of course, King Kong, which, mm-hmm. you know, when he sat me down to watch that, I just went... Because I'd already gotten a fascination for dinosaurs somewhere along the way. And I oh, was sure. only about four or five years old. Not not old at all. You must have you must have been a Ray Harryhausen fan too then. Oh yeah, I loved Ray. Yeah, Ray was the best. Even today I can look at his stuff and go, you know, they can do a lot of stuff, but they're gonna have a hell of a time over the in, in the future beating the Cyclops and the Dragon out of Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. In fact, that entire movie is just perfection. So, Rick, uh, one doesn't get a, a comic book job without having drawn a lot previously. So I want to go back to your childhood and tell us about how you first got an interest in comics. And then when did you start actually drawing? Like, were you trying to draw your own comics at, at a young age? Oh, well, I think I, I'm guessing everybody does that because I did it and I put together all in you know, all these typing pages of typing paper I'd drawn on and made, you know, little comic books out of them. And they were terrible, of course. But my idea of what comic books was, was based upon not so much Jesse Marsh's stuff, which looking back was really terrific work, just great. You know, the more I looked at it, I went, wow, this guy was doing some really individualistic, interesting stuff. And when he started to go blind, his stuff got really interestingly abstract too, which is fun. And not for him, but it was for us. And, uh, and, but I, my stuff was based on like the Shelly mold off Batman stuff. And my concept of it was that it was all done. It had to be done using rubber stamps, you know, because he was just retrying the same things all the time, you know? And I guess that's what Bob Kane wanted. Because mold off was really quite versatile, really, when you get right down to it. He was drawing the Hawkman stuff and aping. Raymond, and then he comes in and he's he's doing that ultra simplistic stuff for Kane. So, so was was when when you started working with Russ, did you have these these pages to show him? And and I mean, because you were the head of the comic book club in in California at the time, and, and exactly that's how you, where I met him. So, what, like, how did how did you like what samples did you show him? And was this before college or after college? Uh, this was after college because during college I had gone to college to do fine artwork and mm. uh, I honestly didn't know anything about it. It's what my folks wanted me to do. And I was the first uh, child of the uh, Hobergs, I believe, to go to college. So oh, wow. uh, this is what they wanted. And where they sent me was UCI and UCI was only fine arts. There was nothing to do with commercial art there. So I studied it and I know I learned a number of things, but I also learned I don't want to do this because I actually got an invitation from one of the uh, uh, lead uh, instructors there to go back to New York and assistant assistant. And I just thought, no, I don't want to do that. You know, that's, wow. that's scary and weird. And I want to draw comics. And I don't believe I could have made it anyway. I didn't really have those concepts in my head. I think it's interesting that your, your parents were actually supportive of you going into the arts. And I'm wondering, did were they trying to get you into fine art because they wanted to get you out of drawing comics? Or did they actually really love the arts and they, they wanted to see you become a fine artist? You're talking two agendas there. My mother wanted me to do whatever made me happy. She was really supportive, a supportive person that way. And uh, my father had another agenda, which was to get the kid through college. So he's got a BA at least. And then to get him back into the family business and have him stay there because he was... Uh, he was really disappointed, I know, when I took everybody, after I'd gotten the Star Wars job and done those co- those covers and stuff, the movie came out, and I took my whole family the night it opened to see it, and I could see that he found it a fascinating film, but that he realized I wasn't going anywhere near that jewelry store again. And I never did. It, you know, there, there was even a moment where my mom... Uh, uh, my dad had just died and she didn't know about running the store by herself. And she started hammering me to come back to the store. And I said, I, I'm not doing that. It's not, wow. I'm still working in comics and I'm going to stay here. And I'd done real well in animation too. Cause 
luckily I started in comics. There wasn't a lot of money. Alita and I had agreed that I probably would only make 20,000 a year tops for the rest of my life. Wow, and yeah. then animation came along and there was a union. And suddenly I realized, oh, all I got to do is get to a certain level and ask for a raise. So I think I started off at $250 a week. And within a year I was at 1500 a week or something like that, which was outrageous for the beginning of the 80s. Going a little bit back with to or the Russ Manning era, um, do you think uh, working with him really shaped your approach to how you draw and your style as a whole? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think two guys in particular, Gil Kane and, and, uh, and Russ Manning. Uh, and I wanted to work for Russ because I was a huge fan of his Tarzan work and a huge fan of Brothers of the Spear and Magnus yeah. Robot Fighter and everything he had done. I just loved that style. And I think that's a, a perfect style in my opinion. I still employ the thinking of minimalize and invite the audience in to, to uh, uh, fill out the rest. You know, I, I think that's a great way to do cartoons or comic books or anything else in our medium. I, don't get me wrong. I think that there's a lot to be said for guys like, uh, let's say, Alex Ross, who just does sure. these magnificent, full, fully flushed out uh, things in comics. But it certainly wouldn't be for me because I'd never make a living at it, and it would just take way too long. One painting takes me a week, week and a half, so I can't oh do that for a living, that's for sure. Let me finish up about Russ. Uh, when I went to Russ, he already had seen my work because being president of the uh, comic book club I was at in Orange County, uh, we held a um, uh, an art show, and I put my stuff in the art show. And he actually came up to me at, during the after the art show and said, uh, uh, "If you'd like to work for me, I'm going to call you sometime and offer you some work." And that happened very quickly thereafter. Uh, he was a tough guy to work for. I mean, he was he was not fun to work for. He was he was kind of frightening to work for 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 an amateur like myself. Sure. But Bill Ray and I had something he wanted. Bill and I together could ape his style and make it look like Russ Manning had done, and he, that's what he wanted. So it didn't last long. I think six eight months tops. You were ghosting then, right? You you weren't getting credit. No, no, I was getting credit. It would be edited by Russ Manning, but we got credit for what we did. Oh, okay. And good. it was just that we were just uh, aping the style and swiping. I understand. Which okay. is really actually good for a youngster. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess the, what I'm, I'm recalling is that Joe Kubert was doing a Tarzan book for DC as well, but was it around the same time or was it yeah. earlier? Yeah, I mean, about the same time. Actually, I swiped a. Uh, uh, a drawing of uh, of Tarzan that he did, mm -hmm. and I realized very quickly thereafter because I was a huge fan of uh, re recollecting the the uh, Prince Valiant stuff mm. that there was a drawing in Prince Valiant that Joe Kubert had swiped. So I was a third generation <laughs> swiper at that point. And it was Perfect. exactly the same pose. <laughs> Well, that's what's cool about comics. There's these these histories of things going on that you you find out about, and suddenly you're part of it. <laughs> Wasn't there, there's a Picasso quote? I think he says, "Good artists copy, great artists steal." Yeah, right? Dick Wildey told me, "Do whatever it takes to get the drawing done." You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were many absolutely. years where there was things I had to swipe that I was not good at. Uh, mm. uh, Jungle Cats. I, I had no confidence in that, so I would I would use those books that. Uh, those how to draw uh, uh, big cats books, the little mm -hmm. paperback things were just great. But again, as time went by, I got more confidence and now I can draw them. I need reference, but I can draw them better and horses I'm much better at and so forth. But that's the fun of it for me as I'm always learning. I guess that's what always interested me about Russ Manning's work is that of the accuracy, you know, that, that he was able to get. And it seemed like it carried into your work. So do you think that that your philosophy helped you in when it came to animation, when you started designing characters uh, for the screen? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And I honestly had a lot more confidence in animation. And the reason was I came into animation at a time when they were just doing uh, the simplistic uh, uh, Hanna-Barbera flat type stuff, which is good. It's a great design thing. But they called me to come work on Godzilla with uh, Wildy. In fact, 
Mark Evanier, one of the guys who's really done a lot for me in my career, recommended me and Will Minio to uh, to Doug, and we met in the lobby the first day, and we've been you know best friends in the business for years. So, and it was the same thing. We could both draw that realistic quote unquote stuff, and the other people in the studio could not very well. So, we were given all the best stuff to do on on Godzilla, along with uh, Dave Stevens, who was there and doing the models and some layouts and stuff. So it was a fun crew to hang out with. And there were other guys who could do this, but they were in layout like, for instance, uh, Mo Gollum. You guys familiar with Mo Gollum's work? Mo is one of the great animal artists of, of, of comics and stuff. Mo did a ton of the painted Tarzan covers for Dell. Mo is just wonderful. And so I met him in that I knew he was in the layout department. I knew who he was. And uh, I had done my first Jana of the Jungle storyboard. And it had two uh, jaguars or panthers fighting. And uh, somebody said, hey, Rick, Mo is laying out your storyboard. And I went, oh, really? I got to go see that. So I run over there. Big mistake. Because he's like going, ah, whoever, whoever drew this doesn't know shit about drawing animals. This, guy, <laughs> this guy's just terrible. You know? <laughs> and there was, there's all my friends and me standing around listening to this. And I'm like, oh. but it was, it was worth it. It's, it. Those are things you look back on and you go, yeah, that, that encourages you to go learn. When, mm, when absolutely. Hmm. So how, how did you make the transition from comics to going into storyboards? Because it's, it, while it's similar, it's also very two different disciplines. It One is, is obviously yeah, a moving object. And, and um, when you're storyboarding for animation, you have to draw a lot of frames uh, to indicate what the animators are going to end up drawing. So what was the process like? Did you have to learn from someone first or did you were you already familiar with it before you actually got the job? I was talking with people who were in the business for a long time, but I just had the concept that was, I guess was was uh, already inside me that comics were design oriented and animation is time oriented. For instance, one of my examples is Spider Man. If Spider Man's in a panel and he's leaping across uh, one panel and punching four or five guys and he goes or something. We, we can accept that. And he can be saying four or five things as he does this, if Stan could fit in at the time. And, and uh, in animation, that can't possibly happen because it's all about time. So he has to leap forward. You have to see that. Then you have to see him hitting one guy, then another guy, and then another guy. And he can say something, one or two things as he goes along. But more than likely, a lot of that dialogue will come after the action. So um, uh, the point is that you've got to have cuts and you've got to put time involved in this. That's another reason why comics and films are never going to be the same thing. It just can't be. You know, what's interesting is that uh, looking at your IMDb page along with Will Minio, it's like you you guys have like the longest <laughs> list of credits I've ever seen. It's, it's insane. Oh, really? I, I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. it's, some, yeah, of it's, it's, some of it's complete crap, you know. There, there's there's oh, moments in there yeah. where they'll credit me with working on 65 episodes of a show, but the reality of it is the union required them, if I was oh. a regular on the show, to get credit on every show. So I probably mm -hmm. worked on 10 or 15 episodes in reality. Some shows I worked on more, like Avengers, Earth, Mightiest Heroes, whatever we did there. I did as many episodes as I could because... I was having a blast on that show. Oh, nice. So maybe nice. I did. I worked on 20 episodes. I don't know. Okay. So well, that, that IMDb sense. doesn't understand that, I know, and, and, the, and the general public doesn't understand it. And these days, I believe the union requires them to only give you credit if you've worked on a show. Yeah, I, I got uh, carpal tunnel syndrome trying to scroll all the way to the bottom of your, your credits. It was, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty impressive. I was like, oh, my God, this never ends. <laughs> I'm I'm just curious when you said that you were doing storyboards and comics at the same time. Tell us how that worked because um, I imagine you were probably doing the comics at home and the storyboards in the studio. Is that correct? Don't I look to be a hundred years old at this point? That's how it works. It just wears the living daylights out of you. Mm -hmm. um, well, to be honest with you, you got to have the love, and the love really gets you through a lot of stuff. A lot of people have 
an enjoyment of what they do, but great fear while they're doing it. You know, I very rarely had that. Only at the beginning working for Russ because I was just scared of failure. First job, didn't want to fail. Uh, but most of the way past that, I had guys like Roy Thomas. Roy was just, he had more confidence in me than I did. And he just said, yeah, just go home and do it and get it to me by Tuesday. And I'd do that, even if it, I didn't sleep the whole weekend or something. But it was fun. And and I think that happened with animation that I can just transverse back and forward. And I kept them separate in that if I was working in studio, all that daytime was can, was uh, for what I was working on in the studio. And then I'd go home at night and early morning and do hours drawing comics and the weekends and stuff. It's stupid, but it's what we, what we did. And because we love what we do, you know, I'm sure yeah. you guys have done some Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, but, you can love but, things a little too much. <laughs> yeah. Not for extended periods yeah. of time, though. I haven't, yeah. I haven't done it. Maybe for a couple months. I would months, never but... do that again. Yeah, that's a I'm lot. I'm actually glad that I'm working on my first. Yeah, I'm working on my first graphic novel, and I'm just enjoying the hell out of it. I'm thinking, awesome. is anybody going to find this entertaining? But I'm finding it entertaining. That's that's well, the way to do, do it, man. Yeah, if you do, other people will as well. How are you creating? Are you doing it all digitally or traditionally? Uh, did either one of you ever see adventurestrips.com when I did Gizmo and Gears, the, the robot story? No, okay. did not. This was, this was going to be a finish to that. And then things started to churn in my brain. And I'm going, it's going to be the same characters, some of them renamed. But now I know how the whole thing's going to end. It like suddenly came to me. I know you're a fan of Procreate. So are are you doing it in Procreate or... I actually can't draw well in Procreate. I sketch in that. I, I have not okay. gotten a handle on how to make that thing work for me so that I can do real detailed stuff. But no, most of it I'm doing here on Clip Clip Studio Paint and in, okay. on my Cintiq, which nice. I can control really well. Have you seen Dreams yet? The, uh, the yes, new yes, guy? yes, yes. Uh, I can't. I haven't had a chance to get into it, but I'm going. Finally, somebody is going to screw Storyboard Pro because those people should be ashamed of themselves for what they do. <laughs> they should be the lynched. <laughs> yeah, well, was, you know, six hundred dollars yeah. a year just to rent the thing. Give me a break. Yeah, you for can an artist, that's a lot of money. Get, yeah. It yeah. is, yeah. And Dream seems to do the same thing, only better because it's, for it's got all bucks. these painterly qualities. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And all you got to do is own an iPad because it's 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 proprietary to procreate an iPad. Speaking of like animation, could, for our listeners, I you know the one thing I don't hear a lot of people talking about is the the structure and the setup of how a weekly cartoon show operates like like a like a um, you know, going from script and story to, you know, who gets it next. And then how, how, can you take us through the, the entire pipeline and like, how do you guys like keep churning out stuff? Let, let me start from kind of the beginning because originally the storyboard guy and the designers could work very simply. And, and I, I actually was one of the first guys with Will and a few of the others to come in and start drawing more elaborate storyboards. That is we were influenced less, by uh, uh, Chuck Jones and those guys who were doing vaudeville more than anything. They were doing, you know, you were coming in from stage right and stage left and all of it was happening right in front of you. And I came in and going, you know, Hitchcock does God shots and those work really well. What are you talking about? We don't do that in cartoons. So uh, we were able to institute some of that, but it made the storytelling simpler. And and anyway, the, the way we would do these things is they would write the script first. And that, that's really the best way to work this stuff. Because if you start in the middle, you're, you're just going to find yourself throwing tons of stuff away. That works for feature, not for television type production. So they'd write the script and then it would be handed to the producer and, and director who would read it. And then they would hand it off to the people that needed to get the ball rolling, which were, uh, first of all, uh, designers, and, and would get it, and then the storyboard guys would get it, and uh, it would expand from there. Because once that was done or in progress, you could you could have layouts begun, 
And somewhere along the way, you would have the voice work being done, sometimes before the storyboards, because they wanted you to work from the storyboard, from the, the, the voices to get the acting correct. Or other times, like in Marvel and stuff, we would do it uh, so that they would have a storyboard to work from and they would act to the storyboard. And in many cases, that works really well because, you know, I've always felt that limited animation should, is, is going to be limited. It's going to be more like a comic book on screen, like an animatic. And what you really need is really solid actors to bring it to life. Doug Wildey mm. did that with Johnny Quest. But even more, the, uh, Bruce Timm and his crew on Batman just did a really yes. great uh, job of picking solid actors. And you can just have the Joker standing there doing this. And Mark mm. Hamill can sell the whole damn thing because that's how people actually speak to each other. We're not doing this and doing all this crazy emoting type stuff. We're just talking to each other. And that's mm. what you want to see on, on, on in a cartoon because anything that does go above that, they can certainly you know take bring it out. But again, you're allowing the, the uh, viewer to add in their two cents and become part of the process, which I find really fascinating and interesting. So anyway, it goes from uh, uh, that phase, which is the production phase into the animation phase after that, after they've actually gotten recordings and layouts done from storyboards and a script and, and the designs done basically. Sometimes the designs have to be done on the fly by mm. the animators or the layout people because there just isn't enough time. And, and money for the other for the uh, designer to do all that. And generally, there's a there's a character designer, there's a background designer, and a prop and and vehicle designer. Um, okay. So yeah. once you get into that, uh, uh, and this is taking weeks just to do this. I used to get initially two or three weeks to do a storyboard, maybe a quarter or a third of a half hour. And these days, it's already up to uh, five to six weeks, which is much more reasonable. And you can see it in the productions there. They're much better thought out. There's much more uh, anime, clever animation going on. And it's led to feature films like the Spider-Man ones that are happening right now, which are just fantastic, just incredible movies. And we wouldn't have those without the little bit of animation we did in Saturday morning. It all led. Sure. It all left a trail of breadcrumbs, right? And, right. And all of this is going to take about um, one episode. Is going to take a long time to put together. The least back then, three months. Today, maybe even nine months. And each one just has to have have its own uh, um, process and its own uh, uh, time to get done. They they factor this in, of course. Wow. So it would take th three months. You said to to do just one episode. It, it, oh, it, it could have, yeah, very easily, because animation itself is very time-consuming. I don't care who's doing it. And back when I was working on it, it was a lot of Korean studios. Okay. Once in a while, they could afford a Japanese studio, but the Japanese were much more uh, meticulous, and they would not do anything any faster than they had to. They would take a show to make money, if you know what I mean. They knew mm. the Americans would pay more, and they could put less work in but they still get great we'd still get great stuff out of it such as pride of the x-men when we did that we got tms and that just worked out great for us they made us look awesome but today that's just kind of a blah piece of work when you look at even what's happening on uh, uh just regular tv animation i mean i watch some of the stuff on netflix and it's just like wow if only we'd have had these guys work for us didn't you work on the Avengers around what ninety seven ninety eight? Exactly, it was the, the worst version of the Avengers. Oh, but the, uh, they also did uh, uh, Spider Man uh, Unlimited with Will Minio, and uh, what else? I did Silver Surfer. I worked on that over there. They had some okay. fun stuff, but they were also of the uh, mind that it was okay to change stuff because really the comic book stuff just isn't that good. And I have a great disagreement with that thinking. Hmm. And it's, it's so back in, uh, was it 89 that you moved up to Seattle? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So why, why Seattle of all places? Just to get out of Los Angeles because it was killing me. I mean, I was just, it took forever to drive around the town to do my jobs and stuff. 
because I was freelancing at that point, and I was doing uh, commercial work as well for a place called Story Barns or, or us or something like that. I think it's mm. still around. Story Barns, but Inc. they were doing commercial. Mm. Yeah, that was it exactly. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they were still they were uh, doing mostly commercial stuff, and I mm -hmm. did get a couple of, of jobs over at Canon Films on. Well, one of them was the the early version of the Spider Man movie, which was. Again, mm. going to be just a wretched thing, you know, when they started telling me, yeah, it's all about this monster that's running around and this guy gets changed into a human spider. And I'm like, no, it doesn't sound like mm. Spider-Man to me, but, but I got to design a lot of ideas for them, like how you would do Spider-Man, you know, running around uh, on, on the ceiling and on the walls yeah. and stuff. And I based it on the old uh, Fred Astaire uh, a dance thing at a royal wedding. Which mm. where he dances up the walls and on the ceiling, right, stuff, right. which involves <laughs> a, a, a room the, rotating, yeah. yeah, yeah, and stuff. So that that was fun, and, and that was done after I'd worked on a Cyborg with with Jean Claude Van Damme. Again, boy, when I went and saw that in the theater just to see my first film, I just went, "I'll never <laughs> watch this again." It was so bad. But I'm sorry to say, Van Damme I actually loved it. It's delightful. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. But I was yeah. judging it harshly because I, I wanted so much more out of it. And I had put quite a bit in. But the director and I, again, I just couldn't get along with the guy. But John claude was wonderful. He would call me in and we would, behind the scenes, when the director wasn't looking, we'd, we'd work out some of his moves and stuff. And the oh, fact nice. that he had me storyboarding was really, you know, really a blast. But Albert Pune just was, was not, didn't want to share any credit for storytelling. He was one of those directors. That he wanted wow. me to be sitting in a closet, hidden away from the world. Yeah, that's what's interesting about storyboarding and directors. It, there's, there's, it feels like there's a split between directors who, who don't want to want it to be known that they've used storyboards. Like they're this mad genius that just comes up with ideas. But I mean, the way these shots are, they get complicated, and you need someone to help communicate it to the rest of the crew what's that's going right. on. Yeah. So after that experience, did. Did you try to seek out more live action or? No, I got away from it. I didn't like it. And okay. it wasn't until I got up to Seattle that I actually got a call from Tommy Lee Wallace and he was doing it up in Vancouver. And mm. he says, can you drive up here and, and stay here during the week and work on this movie? And I said, absolutely. Because at the time, it, was my, it still is my favorite Stephen King novel. I, I just said, oh, yeah, I'll work on that. And then I found out Tim Curry was going to be playing Pennywise. And I went, this is going to be terrific. And it was. It's you know, I, I wanted the new movies to be better, but they just weren't. They went way mm. off track in places and they left a lot of stuff out. For three hours they, they really wasted their time in a lot of ways. We got almost everything in that needed to be there. Back in the day when you were doing comics, did you prefer to ink your own work or would you rather just do the pencils and then hand it off to someone to ink for you? Initially I couldn't have inked it. It would have been terrible. It was Better for me to see somebody else ink it and learn from what they had done with my work. And one of those pieces was was probably that uh, number five cover from Star Wars on Heritage in, in September. Good Lord, I never thought my artwork would sell for that much. I wish I still had owned that piece. Mm. Did you see what it went for? No. $102,000. No. Mm. Oh, my gosh. That we're, hurts my we're, heart. we're in the fine art. I know. Me, too, uh, in that... Uh. I'm just going, you know, why aren't we in Europe? In Europe, I, they'd have had to give me 5% of that, you know, because that's what they yeah. do in Europe. Every art, time an artist's work resells, they have to give them a cut of it. And that's how an wow. artist stays alive. That's how NFTs are, are structured, too. Are you familiar with NFTs? They, they used to be kind of a popular thing about a year ago or so. Um, yeah, yeah I, I've heard like of them, digital, but I'm not sure how they work. It, it's a piece of digital art that's built on the blockchain, but it's encoded in the file itself who the artist is. So every time that NFT sells, the artist himself is guaranteed to get a percentage of the cut. There's no way to like fiddle around it. That's great. Because it's actually built into the NFT. But I, I like your idea of actually original artwork also um, having the art, the original artist get a cut every time it sells. I think that makes perfect sense because that's why it's selling because of the artist yeah, creation. I, I agree. Well, uh, uh, now Heritage has been very good to me. I wish I owned some of it still. There was some great stuff in there. But the stuff that sold so high was fascinating to me. Um, I had a couple of um, 
Avengers pages by Buscema and Don Palmer. Oh my those gosh! Wow. Ten, they went for nearly ten thousand dollars a piece. Jeez, those are my just, absolute favorites. That shocks me. Yeah, me too. And yeah. I paid twenty five bucks for them. I think back in the seventies. Oh my god! They, they were dirt <laughs> oh cheap. My yeah. God. They, well, wow. even, in, even in the nineties. Well, even in the nineties. You mentioned John Buscema, and that's that's one of uh, our favorite artists uh, growing up as as kids. And I read that you actually got to work with John at one point. I'm wondering what that was like. Only for a moment. He came, he was flown into Marvel Productions to uh, do some uh, model work and stuff because Stan had just called these guys up and have Marvel fly Romita. Actually, Romita didn't come. He just did the, the work long distance and sent stuff to us. But John Buscema came in for a week and he was a great guy. I mean, just a wonderful man and a little gruff and, you know, he certainly, you know, knew that he was working with a group of amateurs, but like Larry and I were just drooling all over the guy, Larry Houston, because <laughs> we both just loved John's work. And yeah. And so, uh, and I was always asking him about, about other comics because one of my favorite comics as a kid was Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. I bought when the movie came out. And mm. I knew I loved the work, but didn't realize till years later who had drawn it. And if you've never seen that comic, oh man, that's a really cool comic. Oh, okay. So was it an adaptation of the movie then? Yeah, it was for by Dell and and uh -huh. and cool. pretty pretty faithful, but it had all of the characters and monsters and stuff drawn by John Buscema. And hmm. man, it doesn't get much better than that because at that point he was hoping to do like Prince Valiant or something. You know, he was right hmm. there next to Wally Wood, going, "That's the job I want." And of oh, course, wow. neither one of them got it. One of my favorite, um, well, I think you, you and I both share the same love of the Avengers uh, because of, of John Buscema and, and his work on it. His, his covers on the Avengers are, is what led me to try and buy every issue from 1 to 100 yep. uh, a couple of years yep. ago. And I've, I'm about 10, 10 short, um, but those are just the early, early ones. But uh but yeah, they're hard to beat. Like you can't hold up a John yeah. Buscema cover to anything that is on the racks today without. Oh, you know. I agree. His stuff is just gorgeous. Yeah. But it took him a little while to get going at Marvel. I mean, I understood there was a moment there where they were going, I don't know if this guy's going to work out. Like he did a couple early stories of the Hulk and mm. they were, uh, they were lackluster. Even today I look at him and I'm going, God, his face, his face work is just not great on these. So maybe he was stressing when he did those because very quickly he became one of their better people. And he also was having, he had bad inkers for him at the time. He had George right. Rousseau. So George was a good artist as a colorist and as an inker on other people, but he didn't do anything for John Buscema. And then John got stuck with, I hate to say it, Vince Coletta because I, yeah. I've changed my mind about Vince Coletta on some people. I, I have this. Mm -hmm. I just recently bought the the omnibus for the Invaders, and Frank Robbins and Vince Coletta are an absolutely wonderful team. That's I'm a really just, good well, point. I'm yeah. Thing, but, wow, they're just terrific. Anyway, uh, but John's uh, uh, stuff got so good, and and once he had inked his own stuff, then he had guys like George Klein and Tuska, mm. and these guys could all ink his stuff wonderfully. It was great. And of yeah. course, Palmer came along and, you know, yeah, that's just hard to be. changed the comic book world. It is. Yeah, it's great stuff. Mm. So back in the day with your own artwork and your own comic pages, how did that work? When Once you turned them in, did you ever get to see them again? Or were they the property of oh, yeah. the company? Or no, the, no, no. We had it, the return policy was all, already in, in uh, effect when I started. So I got uh, two thirds of a book and or most or, or uh, three out of five covers and that's how it worked. So I ended up with uh, most of my star Wars covers and there were books where I would contact the other artists and say, can I buy these back from you? One example nice. is when uh, Bill Ray uh, helped me and Dave Stevens jumped in too, to do mm. the final issue of the first star Wars uh, 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 book, which uh, 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 adaptation, which was the battle of, with the death star. And, mm. uh, Called Howard Chaikin and I said, you know, how much for these pages? He said, thirty-five bucks a page. So I bought nice. it. Nice, nice. <laughs> so good for you. Uh, in 2013, and bought a new car. You know? Wow, <laughs> Jesus, that's amazing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little hybrid, but it's a really fun car. I love it. Mm. 
Oh, it's not a Lambo. <laughs> Lambo. Uh, no, no, no. Lambo. We're talking. <laughs> we're, we're talking a, a Ford C Max, you know. And I, I gave That's... up my Mustang for it. So. You know, what I, I first saw your work was uh, All Star Squadron with uh, Jerry Ordway inking ah. you, and I thought you guys ah. were like the best team together. And I love the Golden Age Heroes, and you 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 just did such a wonderful job on that series. Uh, how how did that story come? I mean, I think Roy Thomas wrote that, right? Yeah, he wrote all of those. And I don't think anybody else wrote one issue of those. Maybe Don Glute might have jumped in and helped him on a backup or something. But I doubt it. He he faithfully wanted to guide that stuff, you know. I kind of regret stepping away from it. But then again, the threat was held over my head of, well, we've lost our anchor and we're going to have to hire Vince Collada. And I said, not for my work. Oh, you know, so I that's away. perfect. Yeah, that's, yeah. And it yeah, was that's... just the sort of thing that, Looking back, I can see that the guy would, would do great work, but was undependable for what who he was going to do, you know, who he was going to murder and who he was going to let live, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Jose Delbo de just died yesterday, I believe it was. Oh, and, no. He... And uh, he, he told me a really horrific story about something that uh, he had, had inked by Vince and Wow, it was like, oh my God, that's the kind of thing you walk off into the sunset, slit your throat, and fall into the river. Kind of thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it must have been brilliant. Well, he was nearly in tears telling me the story, and he told it oh, to other no. people I know. So I just couldn't do that to myself when I walked away. So w when you walked away like that, did you have another job uh, at hand, or did you have to scrounge work? Or no, was but there DC somebody... wanted DC wanted to keep me, and Dick in particular wanted to hold me. So uh, I I I was right at that thing that happens sometimes. Again, I've said I'm in the right place, at the right time, and Don Newton passed away, and oh, Batman yes. was over. So I wow. walked on the man's grave, and I just said. Have you guys chosen anybody for this? And Doc Dick went, no. I said, can I get a shot at that? So I got about a year on it and then realized that neither the editor nor the writer liked what I was doing. It really wasn't oh. going to be a pleasant situation. I don't think I did but two issues that I thought were really good because I didn't like the stories. Even though I liked the writer, I just didn't like the story. Mm. You know, they weren't Batman for me. Right. I wanted a shot to do the Joker and characters like that. And, I was doing unknown characters, and mm. the Calendar Man was kind of fun, but that was it. Catwoman was fun. And I got some good inking along the way. I mean, I, I worried about being inked by Alfredo Alcala, but mm. in the end, he did some really nice stuff over me, especially those uh, 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 splash pages. Those came out really good. Uh, and then later, Rudy Nibbers. Uh, oh, was perfect. Inking. Yeah, yeah. Well, they both bury you. I mean, no matter what your style is, it's going to look rude. like Alcala <laughs> get... and Nibras, but they're still really good, you know? <laughs> yeah, the Filipino invasion was just eye-opening to the lush brushwork that uh, those guys were oh, doing. Yeah. I was such a big fan of their stuff. Uh, I think they that influenced me more than I realized, you know, in later years. Um, but at the time, uh, like, who I were got some... To, I got to work with them, too. I got Which to work with both of them at, at, at com in comics and in animation. Uh, Nestor Redondo was oh. one of my designers on the Defenders of the Earth. Oh, really? And Nestor was just amazing to watch. Oh yeah, I did God. an episode of Defenders of the Earth with uh, uh, Prince Valiant and Arn yeah. and, and Alita in it. And he got, I told, I asked him if he designed them and he did. And they looked awesome. They were great. So at the, at the time, like, who were some of your uh, favorite artists uh, that were up and coming? Um, uh, in comics or anywhere, I guess, at that point. Well, I got to work with one of them, Jerry Ordway. You know, Jerry would, came in after me, but he was just so proficient at what he did and just a, a terrific guy, too. I, I still like him. I mean, you know, he kvetched at me a couple of times about things I drew, but that's okay because he was really good at what he did. And I like talking shop that way. I don't mind if somebody says, you know, I don't like the way you do this. And I, I go, well, it's the way I do it. And you'll just have to live with it, you know? Or you can fix it. And another guy is Stefano Guadiano. You know Stefano, right? Oh, yeah. Stefano. Yeah, Stefano is one of my favorite collaborators because he's the kind of guy I can do tight layouts and mm. know that he's going to fill in all the things that need to be filled in right. 
Well, it helps if you're an artist and not just a, a, a tracer, you know, in that respect. Oh, uh, yeah. And he is. Yeah. yeah. He's an We're, illustrator. He's yeah. Really good. I mean, working over Mark, Michael Lark for as, as long as he had, it's you can see where the one person ended and, and he took over. And it was just, yeah, just really, really solid Lark work. Lark had an interesting style. Yeah, Lark had a really interesting style. I, I'd never seen anything like it before. And Stefano showed me pages where mm-hmm. there was penciling on it and then photographs that were just laid in in blue line and stuff. And I've actually yeah. picked up some of this and gone, oh, you know, this is how – the guys in manga have done those beautiful backgrounds for years. They've, they've used these techniques, which are now integrated into uh, the, the thing I'm using, Clip Studio Paint, where they actually right. have a manga thing that allows you to do that process with certain photographs and get something that you can work from directly. And that once you've done all your pencils, which I do in their inking, I, I use their pens and brushes. I don't actually do it in pencil on, on that sort of program. Mm. Then you can actually push a button and it turns into blue line. Talking about digital, um, I imagine when you first started in the animation industry, you were still working traditional when you were doing your storyboards. But did you, oh, yeah. were you at the point, did you meet that point where they everyone crossed over in the studio for working digitally? Were you still there at that time? Uh, yes, that's when I started working on the Avengers, Earth's Mighty Heroes, and I, I was uh, working for Sebastian Montes, a really terrific director and artist, and I loved working with the guy. He worked in uh, in a style similar to what they had done to Batman, because this was the style that was up and coming, and everybody was doing it. You can see it in the Spider-Man films in a lot of ways and stuff, but he, uh, by the time the first season had ended, what I was doing is doing all of my stuff in pencil on paper and then scanning it and putting it through Photoshop and giving them a digital copy uh, of a storyboard. And Sebastian at the end of that season says, listen, Rick, I, I'm, I'm leaving and I, I, I'm going to go do something else. He says, but I want you to know you got to get yourself a Cintiq. You got to start working digitally or they're going to leave you behind. They're already talking about it. I went, thank you. And I went and bought one, even though it was a, pretty expensive uh, kind of a investment for guys like us. And I think I bought it in 2006 or something, the first one. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, uh, it was hard to get used to. And then a local writer here, I can't think of her name, wanted me to do uh, some stuff for a graphic novel she was coming up with, which is about uh, sexual abuse uh, and in a, kind of a futuristic Oof. time, but it gave me a chance to do realistic stuff and use photographs and other things. And I thought, I can't do all this on paper. I've got to take a chance and just dive right into this. And I suddenly was learning tons of stuff on it. And shortly after that, I, I got my job on Halo. And here I was amongst a group of guys who did nothing but work on these things. And I was in class all the time. They taught me a ton of stuff. And I walked away being really proficient with the thing now. Nice. And I love it. I think it's a great tool. I love it. What software were you using back then? Were you using Photoshop? Oh, Photoshop. To okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I did use Storyboard Pro because I had to, but I did all my drawings on Photoshop because in my estimation, uh, Storyboard Pro has very limited tools. Their pencils and things are just are very limited. If you, you worked with it before, Shane? Are uh, you? you broke. No, no, I, we haven't really. Just because it's so uh, expensive, and and yeah, this, it, it's like you're learning a whole new tool set, and it's not just about storyboarding. It's like you're creating a, a, an animatic, and you're almost becoming That's a director. That's the problem. Yeah, it's, you are, and and all they're doing is paying you to do a storyboard. This has gotten to be a ridiculous situation. They keep trying to rectify it in the union, and they need to because we're doing their animatics now. And you got to time the, the voice work to it and stuff. Exactly. And I'm just going, wow, it, it certainly is fun to create these. But again, that's why you need five weeks to do it, a third of a show, because it's just not feasible otherwise. You know, it's interesting. Like years ago, I had, I had interviewed for a storyboard position at 343 Industries as well, probably around the same time that you ended up getting the job, which uh, was awesome because you definitely were a much, uh, much better storyboarder than I was. But uh, how was it working in video games compared to animation or comics? 
It's the one great um, a video game I think I could have worked on because anything past that was all about gameplay. And this had story in it. It had those cinematic sequences, which is what I was hired to work on. And I was working with a really terrific group of guys led by Brian Goodrich. Uh, Brian was very talented and uh, and very forgiving and let you do a lot of stuff on your own and then be discussed and reworked and stuff. And I love working that way. I, I love other people's input as long as they're not just standing over my shoulder telling me what to do all the time. I, I need to be able to get that out of my system and then say, okay, what do we need to fix here? You know? It's, it's interesting because you. I think I remember you stating that you loved Magnus Robot Fighter, and I'm a huge yeah. fan of robots and and fighting, as well. Yes. But um, <laughs> but overall, it seems like your attraction to a, a genre is in the sci-fi or uh, space. Is that correct to say? Uh, I, I like that a lot. Yes, in comics and superheroes, but. Uh, I just am, I don't want to draw any more superheroes. And I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't want to draw a superhero and try to compete with Marvel and DC. And, then that's, and I know things that I would do that way that would be a very, uh, they, would, they would be a, a too much like those characters. I have too much love for Captain America, for instance, or Batman or, or Wonder Woman or characters like that. So in doing, in retiring, like you, you retired how long ago? 2017, I mean, yeah, 2017, I think, something like that. It's okay. been four or five years. So speaking uh, speaking to terms of like uh, as, as artists, at some point, like what does retirement really look like? It, it seems like it, 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 you're keeping busy still uh, with commissions and, and doing your own thing. Oh, but yeah. Did you ever, is this the uh, retirement that you had imagined? I think it's better because I'm doing a graphic novel now, which I really yeah. wanted to do, but didn't have the gumption for it. I was kind of a little fearful of it. And the commissions are fun because basically they're everything I want to do. I don't, I don't agree to things that I don't want to do. Mm. And on top of that, uh, I'm busy with, you know, honeydew stuff. <laughs> you know, I can't get away from that because she's working. I'm not. So I, I have to do a lot of housework and stuff like that. And that's, just fair. She was doing it when I was, and I don't mind. There's certain things I like cooking. For yeah. instance. I, I like cooking. That's fine. Rick, I wanted to get your thoughts on AI these days, and I'm sure you've seen it at some point. And I'm just curious if you've actually messed around with any of the programs that, that generate the AI images and just give us your overall thoughts on where it's going and, and how you see it evolving and, and how it affects artists um, these days. I, I think you might want to uh, play with it because I, I did initially. I, I went to one of those and it's just an open AI and I said, make me a, a picture of this. And I gave it an idea and it gave me something that was kind of like that, but not exactly. And it seems to me that it just is a library. That was a library full of photos and illustrations that this thing just went through and picked out something and showed it to me. And and I thought, well, that might be AI, but that to me is like just a giant library. Then again, I would never use it and put it into any work that I was involved in because that just, why would I do that? That's that's not me. That's not what I'm doing. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm already at a point where I use assets. I mean, I think we all do. I, I mm -hmm. use uh, photographs and uh, I like using posing software when I need to, because mm -hmm. there are always poses that are just not elegant enough for me. You know, I, I like I'll do something where the characters do something, doing something very subtle. Let's say something like this. Mm. And you want to get it so yeah. it looks like that. So you want a photograph of it or you want a, uh, uh, a posed version of it. Mm -hmm. So I use that sort of stuff, but I still draw much of it myself because it's just more fun that way. Did you ever mess with uh, like three D models, uh, uh, like for buildings or spaceships or cars or anything like that? Or yeah, I still do. I have I kept a whole New York City a set that was made for a show mm. I worked on because it's it's a great little FBX file and it's not detailed. I can use it for setting up a shot, but nice. I have to go back in and you know detail the building if I'm going to use it, and or I can use it for just a uh, a shape, you know, like. 
if you're doing a, a, a superhero or something in in a foreground, and then you just right. want a silhouette of a, of a of a city or something, it's great for yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, I think all those things are great assets. And I had to use it to to get Master Chief right when I was doing Halo. Oh and sure, they have all that stuff. That's that's where I learned it. Is I went, God, how am I going to draw this guy right all the time? And then I realized, all oh, these guys have got a rigged puppet up. And I said, oh, I worked that. And then I said, you know anything about Maya? I said, no, but let me see how it works. And I went, oh, this is just posing, and I can do that. It's just nice. puppeteering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So sure, yeah. most of the things I did with, with the storyboard were poses of him, and then I would use it to draw from and or trace it, and then you know go into detail. Oh, that's perfect. That's a, yeah. That's a difficult character to draw. Yeah. And then back in the day, in the 70s, prior to like when everything was just a mouse click away for reference material, when we used to have to, you know, either take photographs or go to the library and make photocopies, is that kind of how you handled it? See over my shoulder there? Yes. That's, mm-hmm. that's just the start of my library. The library goes to the wall mm. and turns the wall and goes down the other wall. Wow. So, yeah, I still have a ton of my reference library. And or I would go to a library and find what I need. I, I think I remember um, Alex Toth working with Doug Wildly at some point too. Were you there around that time, or was that after Toth left? No, but I have two interesting Toth vignettes that I will now tell because I tell them as often as I can. Uh, okay. Toth was notorious for being cranky. Was was the best oh, way yeah. to put it. And and uh, but we all loved his work. That's for sure. So when I was working for Russ, when I first started working for Russ, uh, we weren't always in the studio because he didn't want us sitting around there drawing all day. He would have us there when we would bring a story in and Bill and I had to correct what he didn't like. So we would sit in the studio for a day or two days and do that. There was other people doing stories for him, such as Alex Nino and Alex Toth. Both were doing Tarzan stories. And mm. Alex Toth brought his in one, that one day when we were there. And we all got up to look at it, and um, Dave was there, Dave Stevens, because he mm. was assisting Russ on the comic strip. And um, Bill Ray and I were there, you know, f- fixing a story. And Alex pulls out this eight page story and just spreads it out. And it's just gorgeous, of course. And Russ goes, This is really terrific, Alex. He says, The only thing I'm going to have to do on it is redraw all the faces. Oh, no. <laughs> Alex. Yeah, he had to say that to him. He probably could have taken the thing and done that, and then Alex could have got mad about it later. But Alex went, no, you're not doing that. And, oh. and he starts to gather it up, and Russ says to him, we've also already paid you for this story, Alex. And Alex just gives him this really scorching look and then begins to tear all the pages up. In front of oh, all Jesus. Of and no. we all backed away and sat down and we're like doing this because we were sure there was going to be a fist fight. These two guys oh. were raging at each other. My God. And that's the first time I really met Alex. And then he left and Russ followed him out to his car and they were arguing and stuff. And when Russ came back in, all of us just wanted to get out of there. But we had to stay until Russ dismissed us, basically. Because it oh. was like school when you, that, that young. Yeah, I think that was really admirable to tear up something he didn't want published because he was really picky about that. You know? Yeah. If you were going to work with Alex, you took what he gave you or, and either don't publish it or, or give it back to him. Do you plan on self publishing the, the project that you're working on now, or do you think that you can, I don't know. I'm going to do a Kickstarter first okay. and, and see if I can make enough money to find a way to do it. I don't mind working with somebody else because I'd love to have an editor. I, I don't know who to go to. But I'd love to have a competent editor to look at my stuff and tell me if they think something's wrong, give me an opinion, which I can say, yeah, you're right, I should fix that. Or I can say, yeah, fuck you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> as, as we wrap up, we, we tend to ask uh, our guests if, if they have uh, any advice that they could give to somebody who's either just starting out in animation or comics or uh, somebody who's kind of where you are at in your uh, stage of life and, and career. What I would say is, uh, be ready for a lot of work, and and you know, don't be surprised if for many years you're doing seven days a week, you know, ten or twelve mm-hmm. hours a day. I I did it, and that's the way it worked for us for a lot of years. 
Many times yeah. I couldn't go to a family gathering because Sunday was a day leading into a deadline and it was just stupid to do it. So I didn't do it. And it doesn't matter anyway. I don't go to church. So that didn't matter. But I would say focus on your work, but also um, find a way to make your relationships work. Man, mm. it can destroy relationships. It just does. And if you're doing the same thing, I can't even re 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 uh, recommend that because I've seen, you know, people, you know, break up because, you know, one of them suddenly gets, starts to get more famous than the other one, and then it becomes a problem. So, like my wife always told me, uh, basically, you know, she basically would say, don't let it go to your head, you know, you're you're not that famous kind of thing. These days she <laughs> says things like, you know, like I was having trouble reconciling some of the stuff Emerald City wants me to do, and I know it's it's smart. I mean, they're they're trying to get me to, market myself real well i've never had a convention do this and i'm going wow hmm. these guys are really doing this i'm telling my wife about it and she's going they know who you are they shouldn't be pushing you around i said they're not pushing me around they're they're, they're trying to focus my my attention on something i shouldn't be doing and i thought so she does think i'm famous huh? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's another thing about retirement <laughs> I'm having yeah. more fun now than I've ever had in my career as far as who I am in, 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 in the business. Where, where would people uh, find more of your work if they were looking for you? Well, I would say my website, but give it another couple of days. I've got a couple of new things I want to put into it, and that's uh, uh, Rick Hoberg Story Artist, all one word with the, each word capitalized, uh, dot okay. com. And... Uh, I'm trying to put up new stuff in there as fast as I can, but also I'm, I'm an older guy and I like Facebook because I can talk to people there mm. and I just can't seem to get and get much said in, in much conversation going on, uh, let's say, uh, uh, X for instance. I don't, I don't want to deal with that guy's stuff anyway. Right. And, or, um, uh, Instagram, Instagram is kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a brief. You don't really have in-depth conversations and, or, People browse and they see what you're doing because I try to put every drawing I do up there, and I get good reaction from it. You know, yeah. So that's that's another place to keep an eye out for what I'm doing because there's going to be something new every couple of weeks. Oh, fantastic! Well, I uh, want to uh, thank you for spending time with today, Rick, and and sharing your stories and your life. I'm Shane Patrick White, and with my co-host Lance Laspina, and. As always, thanks for watching.